meantime, you can turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we'll be reading verses 31 through 38. As we continue our series, we're walking step in step with Jesus through the gospel of Mark, seeing the steps that Jesus took so that we might match his steps. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. The Bible says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, whoever loses his life for my sake, and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Let us pray. We would follow you, Jesus. We would walk step in step with you. So show us clearly from your teaching this morning what it means to be your disciple. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. One day a wife bought an expensive dress. When the husband saw the price tag, he said to his wife, Wife, what on earth possessed you to buy such an expensive dress. And the wife replied, the devil made me do it. The devil made you do it, said the husband. What do you mean the devil made you do it? She said, well, when I tried the dress on, the devil looked at me and said, ooh, girl, you look good in that dress. The husband, mystified, said, Well, why didn't you tell him, get behind me, Satan? She said, I did. And when he got back there, he said, ooh, baby, you look good from here, too. (laughs) You know, we just cannot get away from the devil. He's always there like a lion on the prowl looking for someone to devour, always waiting, always ready with the next argument or the next reason or the next excuse. And what is especially terrifying is that he sometimes comes in the form of those that we know and that we love. And that's what happens to Jesus here with his good friend, his follower, his disciple, Peter. We saw last week that Jesus has crossed the point of no return. He is in open confrontation with the religious leaders, and he himself is focused on going to Jerusalem. He's fixed and focused his attention on that purpose. And now... Here is Peter, one of his disciples, seeking to get him off point. You notice in verse 31, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Must. That one word carries upon it all of the weight of Every prophecy that was ever uttered 
by the prophets of God. And, and all of the types and the shadows that, were, that belonged to the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, that word, on that word must hangs all of that burden. The purpose of God in all, all of redemptive history. The purpose of God in the plan to redeem people is focused on that word must. Son of man must suffer many things. And here is Peter rebuking Jesus. And yet Jesus will not be deterred. He will continue to walk with purpose. And we see that what it means to walk step in step with Jesus is that we too must walk with purpose. Purpose, But not just any purpose. As we will see, we must walk according to the purpose of God. Coming to Mark chapter 8 and just kind of the 30,000 foot view. Again, there's, a, there's many steps that Jesus takes here that we, we don't have time to unpack and yet they're, they're there. We see him feel compassion for those who are in need early on in verse 2. I have compassion. We see that he acknowledges the blessings of God in verses 6 and 7 as he's going to feed the 4,000. He blesses the bread before he breaks it. He warns other people about spiritual danger in verse 15 about the, the leaven of the Pharisees. He warns his disciples about, he reminds his disciples about truth in verses 17 through 20. He brings clarity to others concerning his identity uh, there in verses 27 through 30. These are all, again, steps that we can take with Jesus as we walk step in step with Jesus. But this morning, we want to focus on this step where Jesus steps with purpose. Every action that Jesus took, every move he ever made was on purpose. Jesus didn't do anything by accident. Even early on, again, Feeding the 4,000, that, the, the purpose behind the feeding of the 4,000, it was the compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion for the 4,000. Jesus teaching his disciples about the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. That was motivated, purposed by his love for the disciples. Healing the blind man twice there in Bethsaida in 8 verses 22 through 26. That was motivated by and purposed by the apostles' lack of understanding. Got to take another look at that in more detail on your own and see how it fits into the larger narrative of Mark chapter 8. But again, everything Jesus did was on purpose. Why he began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things. There's purpose. There's intention behind this. And so... Again, Peter brings Jesus aside, began to rebuke him in verse 32. And Jesus, he, he turns, he sees his disciples. And once again, out of, out of love for his disciples, he has to rebuke his friend, his follower, his disciple. And he equates Peter with Satan. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says to Peter. Why? Why? For, let me tell you why, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus taught his disciples that a disciple's mind must be set on the purpose of God. That's what it means to walk with purpose. And so Jesus rebukes Peter there in verse 33. Why? I mean, after all, Peter's just trying to save Jesus' life. If he's got to go and die, if he's going to be killed. Jesus makes it plain. His mind, Peter's mind, is not set on things above. It is not set on the things of God. He has his mind set on the things of man. And ultimately, what that means is, Peter's purpose is not aligned with God's purpose. He's out of sync. He's out of step with the purpose of God. And so Jesus teaches Peter, teaches his disciples, that they must align their purpose with God's purpose. And indeed, God's purpose must come first. 
And until Peter aligns himself with God, he's actually in line with the devil. He's in line with the devil himself, and his actions are devilish. If Peter is successful in getting Jesus to get off of the purpose of God, he is ultimately attempting to thwart the very plan and purpose of God in redemption. Now, of course, Peter is not successful in that. But we see, again, his actions are devilish. He has his mind set on the things of man. He is in line with Satan. And so Jesus, verse 34, he calls the crowd to him with his disciples, and he's going to instruct them, going to give them teaching about what it means to be a disciple, what it means to walk on purpose, to step on purpose. And it means that we must have purposed actions. Notice, the first thing Jesus demands, commands of his followers, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. There's, there's a purposeful action there. Self-denial. You must deny, he must deny himself. And when a disciple denies self, he is ultimately seeking to make God's purpose his or her purpose in life. The disciple is seeking to make God's purpose the purpose of their entire life. So first, we must deny self. Then Jesus says, and take up his cross. To take up a cross. You know, we, we, we sometimes throw this term out, that phrase out, when it comes to any and every difficult situation in life. Well, that's just my cross to bear. Could be a difficult spouse. Uh, could be uh, an addiction. Could be a, a hard job or a terrible boss. It's just my cross to bear. Is that what Jesus means when he says, take up your cross? Why did Jesus come to this world? What was his, what was his purpose? It was ultimately to go to Jerusalem, take up his cross to a mountain outside of Jerusalem called Golgotha on which he would die. He was born to die. And so when Jesus takes up his cross, it's for the purpose of dying. What is the purpose of us taking up our cross? And follow me, Jesus goes on to say. Where are you going, Jesus? To Jerusalem and indeed to that hill outside of Jerusalem to die. You see, when Jesus tells us to take up our cross and when a disciple determines to take up his cross, that means you're going to make Christ's purpose your purpose. And you will die to yourself daily. That's what the parallel account in Luke tells us. Take up your cross and follow me. The disciples' purpose in life, again, the purpose, the step that we take on purpose is that we follow the steps of Jesus as closely as we can, as the Spirit helps us to do that. Deny self, take up cross, follow Jesus. And then verses 35 through 38 teach us that we are to expect God's greater reward. That Jesus taught that, that walking step in step with him and, and matching his purpose, it does bring a reward. Wait a minute, you just said we take up our cross to die and to die to ourself. That's a, that's a painful thing, that's a hard thing. Yes, but we know that the one who dies on the cross on the hill outside of Jerusalem is the one who is raised by the power of God. And so the greater reward here, Jesus begins to explain, look, if you're going to lose your, your life for my sake and for the gospel's sake, you're actually going to save it. You're going to save your life. Uh, you may gain the whole world, but you forfeit your soul. Did you really make a good deal? Was that a good trade? Again, Jesus is saying, what's it going to be? You're going to lose your life to gain me? You're going to save your own life and, and gain the whole world? Those who save their life, Jesus is clear, it means you will lose it. You will lose your life for his sake. And notice verse 37. When you get through all of this and you've gained the whole world, but you've lost your soul and lost yourself in the process, what can a man give in return for his soul? What would you give in return to get it back? 
Half the world? All the world? Why'd you get in the rat race in the first place? Did you get a good deal? But those who lose their life for the purpose of God, for the purpose of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, you're, you're actually going to save it. And so their purpose is to give up their life. Our purpose is to give up our life for Christ. And the reward is the salvation of our souls. Again, it's not us doing the saving, by the way. And so as we come across the bridge of time, we come to our walk with Christ. As we seek to follow Jesus, if we are going to walk in the way that Jesus would have his disciples to walk, if we would live our lives truly as those who bear the name Christ, then we need to learn from what the teacher taught. We need to hear Christ. We need to hear him clearly. And Jesus here teaches that walking step in step with him requires purpose, even the purpose of God. We know Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, don't we? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, the good, pleasing, and perfect will. Renewing the mind. And that is what we are to do. We are to have a mind that is renewed by being transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, also really makes this idea pop about what your mind set upon. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, If then you have been raised with Christ... Paul, writing to Christians in Colossae, and the word there for if that begins the sentence could also be translated since, and I think that's perhaps the force of this for Christians, since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And that's that's a clear echo of what Jesus is teaching us here in Mark chapter 8. Is your mind set on the things of humans? Is it set on the things of the world? Set on the things of the earth? Or is it set on the things above? The things of God? What's your mind set upon? And if our mind is set upon the things of God, it is ultimately set upon the purpose of God. His purpose, His intention. Otherwise, our minds, again, are set on the things below, set on the things of humans and of this earth, and and really, we are minding the things of the evil one. There's no middle ground, not for Jesus. No third way where you can kind of have a mind that is sometimes set on the things above and sometimes set on the things below. Or, 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 you know, trying to hold these two things together. Again, for Jesus, it is not an not a and both. It's an either or. So our mind must have in focus the purpose of God. We are aligning our purposes with the purpose of God. A purpose, by the way, that stretches all the way back to before the beginning. All the way into eternity past. In our thoughts, in our desires, in in whatever it is, we are to be seeking to be in harmony with God. And involved in this is the renewal of our mind. Uh, And we renew our minds through uh, the disciplines of being in God's Word and praying and focusing upon uh, Him and and His Word. It is we're, we're seeking to Throw out the bad and bring in the good. And so what that means is, go back to verse 34 and start again. And look at the actions that are required of us. The the very purposeful actions that we are to pursue. You see, once our mind is set, it doesn't just stop in the mind. 
that th those internal motivations then find external expression in the things that we do. Definite actions arise when we set our purpose on God's purpose. And it begins with denying self. To deny self is to take apart the flesh. To undo the flesh. We've had a lot of practice all our lives. We've been acquainted with the flesh. But the call of the master upon the creature is to take that creatureliness that has been shaped and, and focused upon the flesh and to take it apart piece by piece in Christ so that then God in Christ by the Spirit can now shape and form you after the image and likeness of Christ. It's a painful work to take apart the flesh, to deny self, and yet it is a, a necessary work to put the self to death so that Christ might live in us. Deny self. And then take up your cross. This is, again, purposing to become a living sacrifice. Just like we wrote, what we read in Romans chapter 12. A living sacrifice. It is, it is a commitment, a, a dedication to sacrificial living. The same spirit of sacrifice that is seen in our Lord. Isn't that what he does when he takes up his cross and goes to Golgotha to die? The same spirit of sacrifice. Wholly given over to the will of the Father. That's what we see in the life and death of Christ. And so, in the same way, we must be willing to even give up our own life for the purpose of our Father in heaven. And that when... When what we desire, typically motivated by the flesh, comes heads up with the purpose and intention of God for our lives, we're willing to sacrifice our desire for the purpose and intention of God. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Follow Jesus. There are so many pathways in this world. Some of them very well trodden, some of them very broad. Others are very narrow, not as well traversed. Maybe with uh, uh, some of the, the growth that's come up with the, the thorns that pull at you as, you as you walk through, and maybe you've got to turn sideways just to get through the path. Many different pathways. And Jesus is saying, Many people go after those very broad and well-trod pathways. But these other ways that Jesus himself has trailblazed, that's where I want you to walk. It will require you to take a detour, as it were, off of that well-trodden path onto that path which is straight and, and narrow, and yes, even sometimes difficult. But he's left the steps that we might walk faithfully with him the pathway that He desires for us to walk. And when we do that, we look for God's greater rewards. We expect them. We expect even His eternal rewards. Jesus says there again, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. When He comes with the glory of His Father and with the holy angels. No, we don't, we don't want Christ to be ashamed of us. In the parallel passages in Matthew and, and Luke, you get the, the inverse of this. Where if we, in our lives, if we confess Christ as Lord, He'll confess us before the Father. And the walk that is intent on following the purpose of God and honoring Christ in everything we do, that is a walk which God rewards with eternal life, with salvation, with all of the good and glorious things that He has for us. You see, again, the, the purpose of Christ in everything. Every step He took was on purpose. Every teaching, by the way, that He taught was also on purpose. 
that if we would be his disciples, we must walk full of purpose, even the purpose and intention of God that he has for us and for our lives. To set our minds on the things of God. To set our minds on the things above. That's the call of God. To actively be making changes to our lives as we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. So that we might become more and more like Christ. And as we focus and look to and expect God's greater reward, these are the ways that we step on purpose. It's what Christ taught us to do. If you want to know what it means to follow Christ, take a good long look here in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. In, in no uncertain terms, in very specific terms, Jesus lays it out. What does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple? But by living as a disciple, by walking step in step with Jesus, you're learning what it looks like to become more and more like Christ. That our lives reflect more and more of Christ's glory. You see, Christ had the same characteristics. He doesn't call his disciples to something he himself is not willing to uh, do himself. He denied himself an entire lifetime of denying himself. But especially when he took up his cross and walked with it to Golgotha. Jesus blazed that trail. And he invites us to follow with him. If we would deepen our relationship with him, then we must match his steps and we must follow him. Let's commit this to prayer. We are we are of the dust, Father. And so be mindful of our frame. As we seek to learn your purpose, and as we seek to step into your purpose for our lives, we pray that you would renew our minds so that we, may, we might set our minds on the things that are above. We pray that you would enable us to deny ourselves, that we would truly take up our cross with all the force that Christ means for that. And that you, by the Spirit, would enable us to follow after him day by day. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for the gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.